It is with great sadness that I announce the death of my teacher, friend, mentor, father figure, Professor Bradley J. Steiner. Brad passed away in the early hours of December 5th, Saturday. Brad had been declining in health over the years, and <clears throat> I think he kept a lot of that hidden. Um, I think, too, that he knew his time was coming based on some things he said to me that I really didn't put together till later, but uh, um, I was ranked seventh degree black belt in 2012, and it took me another eight years to, and he finally promoted me recently to eighth degree black belt, and that was about right. The Dan ranks took about eight, nine years for, to, to get through them. The early one's a little bit better, but, uh, and then he promoted me to ninth degree black belt like a month later, which I thought was really odd. But he said he wanted to make it clear that uh, I was the man to, to take things over. I didn't make much of that, not realizing that maybe he understood what was coming. I, I don't know. But um, <clears throat> I met Brad in um, 1979 in Phoenix, Arizona, a place he hated. <laughs> uh, but he met two of his uh, best friends there, James Jarrett, uh, another mentor of mine and, and myself. Uh, I was working out at Fitness Architects on 16th Street in Phoenix, and one day uh, this guy comes in, Brad Steiner, and he met with um, a, a third mentor, I'm going to talk about these three men in a little bit, Clint Davis. And Clint was a very rough man, and uh, I had seen Clint in battle a number of times, and he was nobody to mess with. And, when he saw me, he said, I met this really interesting guy. And uh, he read the, he brought a book in it. He left this pamphlet. He teaches self-defense and he's, he's wanting to teach lessons here. And he said, you might want to, you and I might want to take some lessons from the guy. He really seems interesting. And I had just come off a severe beating, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. And uh, <clears throat> I was feeling about that big, you know, my self-esteem. But I remember the book he left was, the Tactical Skills of Hand-to-Hand -hand Combat. And I remember <coughs> Clint handed me the book. It didn't look like this in those days, but Clint handed me the book. It was more of a, like in a notebook form. You know, he had self-published it, I think. And I remember I just randomly opened the book. And here's what I read. Scene. A street corner in a large city, your city. It is about 9.30 in the evening. There is no one around but you. You are waiting to pick up your wife. You are going to walk her home after her visit with her parents. After five minutes, your wife arrives. She. Hi, honey. You. Hi, dear. A punk about 40 pounds heavier than you suddenly steps in front of you. He makes a dirty crack and deliberately shoves you into your wife. Punk. Watch your ass, mother. You. Furiously, without warning, at the top of your lungs. Fuck you, you yell. As you yell, you rip into the animal's eyes with the fingers of both hands going for him like a madman. Blinded, the animal clutches his eyes in terror. You kick him several times as hard as your strength and your fury permit in his exposed groin area. As he crumples like the sack of garbage he is, you kick his head. Then you die for him, seizing his hair. With furious determination, you repeatedly bash his empty skull again and again on the sidewalk. You then arise. Take your wife's arm, apologize for the foul language you used, and continue Continue peacefully on your way. <clears throat> I remember literally thinking, this guy's crazy. I want to study with this guy. Especially based on what had happened to me. Uh, the beating had taken place. I was really just barely recovering from the broken ribs and the concussion that I had had. And uh, I don't want to get into the long story about it, but... Uh, I was a grappler, and that was my background as a sportsman, and I find it interesting, too, that a whole lot of the students in the American combative systems backgrounds are, in fact, in grappling. 
you know, people think we don't know anything about grappling. Plenty of the students know a lot about grappling. It was always my method of fighting. Uh, I think what they call in the MMA these days, ground and pound. That's how I always did it because I was, you know, I'm five foot six, and in those days I was 205 pounds. I was very powerfully built, and uh, <clears throat> I'd had my ass beat enough times of guys with, you know, longer reach, and I always came in and did a double or single leg takedown and just tackled him into the nearest wall, got him on the ground, and and did my thing. So in this situation, we, we ended up at this party, and uh, we were invited some, by some beautiful girls, and and when we got there, we didn't know these girls. And when the uh, four of us got there, uh, I re realized immediately, this isn't good. These guys didn't like us one bit. And I looked at the guys with and I said, we need to get out of here. So we started to exit and that wasn't gonna happen. The crowd came out with us. And this guy confronted me and the group circled around us and. I was really trying to beg off the whole thing, you know, telling the guy, look, we're, we're just going to go, you know. But we were innocent, we hadn't done anything, and, uh, but he, he wasn't going to have any of that. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say I let the guy Sunday punch me, you know. Uh, he kind of turned back and cold cocked me, and I remember, like always, every time I got hit in the face, and every time I've ever got punched in the face, I never got knocked out, but fury would come over me. And that rage came over me, and I remember grabbing the guy by his clothing. And there was a car right there, and I was going to ram his head through that car window. And all of this happened in a literal split second. And I thought, don't do that, you'll kill the guy. So I went down to the ground with him. Well, we're going at it for, I don't know, not too long, and then somebody either kicked me in the ribs or hit me with something. I think he kicked me, a, a second assailant, one of the crowd there. And uh, it totally took the wind out of me, broke my ribs. I was completely helpless at this point. So, and by the way, this guy didn't stay on the ground. You know, all fights go to the ground kind of BS, which I will address in later videos. He got up on his feet and started kicking my head in. And then his friends started kicking me as well. And I'm down there in the fetal position, and I've got a couple of teeth that are knocked backwards in my mouth. and couple of ribs broken and I had a concussion and I remember there was a girl there I still remember that I said God you're gonna kill him stop she you know and thank God for her I, I, I don't know how much good she did because a patrol car police officers pulled up right at that point and of course the group scattered and I got up immediately I didn't know how badly I was hurt I was embarrassed more than anything I got up off the ground and I remember the officer came up to me and he looked at my face and he got kind of close and he looked and he went Oh, he had this look on his face. He goes, we need to get you to the hospital. And I said, no, I don't want to go to the hospital. There's blood all over me. So I just want to go to the bathroom and wash myself up. And he insisted that I, that I go to the bathroom, and, or I mean, I, I go to the hospital with him. And, you know, they, I said no. And, and uh, so uh, he said, okay, you know, you do what you want to do. And I left and... Uh, as we drove away, I don't think we got more than 10 minutes away, and I looked at the guys I was with, and I said, yeah, you need to take me to the hospital, you guys. I, I realized, you know, it was setting in that I was pretty badly injured. And I went to the hospital, and, um, you know, it was really just a, a beating like I'm sure many of you who are listening to this went through. Yeah, my self-esteem was shot. So this timing of meeting uh, the professor was perfect. And uh, so uh, after reading that passage in the tactical skills of hand-to-hand -hand combat, um, I contacted him and, and said that I wanted to speak with him about training. So we met at the gym and, and we sat down and we must have spoke for about an hour. Brad always took a lot of time with people and listened very carefully. Remember, I don't know this guy. I just seen what he wrote in this book. I've never seen anybody write anything like that. This sure wasn't traditional martial arts this guy was talking about. And I told him what had happened to me, and, and uh, um, he listened very patiently. And at the time, I was a bodybuilder, not a competitive bodybuilder, but I was a bodybuilder nonetheless. I, I was putting a three or four hours, even more than that, a day in, into training with the, the great Clint Davis at the time. And, uh, and Brad had said to me, he said, look, 
you're not going to need a whole lot of training with me. He said, you maybe get a belt rank with me or spend three months or so, and I think you'll be completely satisfied uh, with what we can accomplish in that time. He said, you know, your forte is, is clearly you've been looking at me, weight training, and that's where you're going to devote your time. And I agreed with him that, you know, I, I didn't want to become a martial artist. I just didn't want to go through that again. And, you know, because after that had happened to me, certainly after the fact, I'm thinking, why didn't I ram that guy's face through the glass, you know? Why did I do this? And why did I react the way I did? You know, and it took me a long time to understand that it was my mindset. I was a sportsman. That's, I, I wasn't a warrior. You, you can't make a split decision like that at the time. You do what you're trained to do. And that can be the problem with some of the competitive martial arts, that you're going to react in those ways. But that, that's a different issue. So I started to, to train with the professor, and uh, <clears throat> um, it was great. His class, I'm trying to remember, was I think it was two hours long in those days. It was very long, and there were only three of us. It was uh, um, my wife Jody at the time and uh, <clears throat> another guy, Jim, Jim Law. And it was just the three of us training, and he pounded us. I mean, he, he worked us so hard. I'd been a football player. I was a defensive back, a, a, a monster man, they call it, the strong safety. And, uh, you know, any of those who played football, you go through two a days when you're training. And back in those days, the coaches weren't all that intelligent about training. They tried to kill you. They didn't give you water. You were dehydrated. And, and, uh, and they ran you till you dropped. You know, literally, guys would be dropping. I know a lot of you guys know what I'm talking about. Well, Brad pushed us like that. He obviously let us drink water. He wasn't foolish, but I, he knew just how hard he could push us, and, and we loved it. I mean, he pushed us to the limit, and um, we, we got the, the full Steiner effect from him in those days, and it, it was wonderful. And the year was 1979, and I trained with him for three years in 1979 to 82. Uh, he left in 82 to Seattle. Uh, it was probably more like about two and a half years or something because I think he was in Phoenix for a period of time uh, and the classes had stopped and, and uh, he was a very difficult man to locate. Uh, my father had a very high security clearance with an engineering firm that he worked with and I asked him, I said, Dad, do you think you could find this man for me? And he goes, well, let me give it to my people and he did and he came back to me, he goes, who is this guy? I said, what do you mean? He goes. Well, my friend looked into it and he said, uh, this guy doesn't want to be found and he knows what he's doing. And I said, oh, okay, let's not try to find him anymore. So off he went to Seattle and I think he did contact me and let me know he had gone. But uh, I was at the class, every class, and I'm trying to think in those days, I think there were in those days, maybe it was only two classes a week, might have been three, and they were two hours long. I was at every class. I remember, too, I used to ride my bicycle to the class in the 110-degree uh, summer heat. And I came in one time, and uh, I, I got there early before the other students, because there were, there were a few more students than Jim and Jody at that time. There were probably a couple other guys, three, maybe three or four other guys. <clears throat> and I didn't know Brad, really. And we started to talk, and he said, oh, you live in the neighborhood, huh? And I said, no. He goes, well, where do you live? And I said, Tempe. And he looked at me and he goes, that's another city, isn't it? I said, yeah, it's another city. He goes, you ride your bike here from another city? And I said, yeah. He said, well, how many miles is it? And I said, I don't know, about 28. I, I was nuts in those days. I, I would drive the, uh, but I, I think Brad had a, you know, a real fondness for me at that point. And, and then he'd just pound us for the, the 90 minutes or however long the class was. And I'd get back on the bike and I'd head back to Tempe on the bike. And I, I did that only on the Saturday class. The other days I drove there with, with Jim and Jody. But, you know, the first lesson I took with him, he answered so many questions in my mind. It was like if I never took another lesson with him, he had changed everything. One of the things I learned from him was that there's not an exact move for everything the other guy's doing. And of course, don't wait for the other guy to do his thing, do it first. 
And in the, my situation, that was clearly what was called for. I had a group attack that was about to happen to me, and uh, but I, I didn't want to fight with the guy. I thought maybe we could just reason it out. I hadn't done anything to him, but that first lesson I knew right there. And uh, I always approach my own students that way too. I would tell a guy, after you take the first lesson with me, you're going to know whether this is for you or not. And if a guy's hesitant about it, I would tell him, well, maybe this isn't for you. You know, maybe there's another approach, and certainly there are people that are going to take another approach to things, but um, <clears throat> man, he built me back up. He picked me up, and he dusted me off, and he got me feeling good again, and, and I loved the training. I loved everything I, we, we were learning from him. And, and the biggest thing that he did was, was psychological. At the time, I didn't understand what was actually happening, but uh, he was brilliant that way. He was a pioneer in that. He used the methods of hypnosis, and Brad was a licensed hypnotherapist, to reach the subconscious mind in training people, and he, he taught me how to do it as well. And by the way, the, the video project him and I have been working on for the last year will be coming out soon. And, uh, he did a piece, about a 40-minute piece, of what he called My Method of Teaching. And when I saw it, I was really pleased because I, I thought he'd never discussed that publicly. But that's going to be available for purchase very cheaply, too, by the way. But uh, he really knew how to get into a student's head. And he knew, he knew the right thing to say. Some students were too timid, you know, a lot. And he needed to bring them up and charge them up and get them furious and get them angry. And some students were fighting way too much. I knew men like that. And he knew how to bring it back and temper it down and teach you, no, let somebody else control you. Let somebody else goad you into a fight. But he always knew just what to say. Uh, well, he went to Seattle and uh, I quit ASU. I was working on a teaching degree and and uh, after three years, I didn't want anything to do with that. So I realized I needed to do something. So I went to DeVry, and I got, to, I got a tech degree, their two-year program, which was 10 times harder than the program I was doing at ASU. Uh, DeVry was a, a tough school. And my dad was disappointed that I didn't become an engineer, but I didn't really want to become an engineer. So when I got the degree and I graduated with honors, it was real easy for me to get a job in the field anywhere. So one day I decide uh, I'm going to go to Seattle. I'm just going to pack up and go there and continue my studies with him. I loved it so much. I had no intention of teaching at that point, but I was a green belt in the system. And in the two or three years that I'd been with him, I'd only got two belt advances. Uh, he was really hard on me on the belt ranks. He was on a lot of people, but uh, uh, on me especially. I mean, I, I would often spend a year or two with belt before he'd give me the next belt. So I wanted to get to that next level, that purple belt level, and find out what was next and what, what we were training. Uh, I had a new truck. My, my grandmother had bought me a new truck for a graduation gift, bless her for that. And uh, I had $1,500 to my name, and I packed up the truck, and everybody said, what are you doing? You, you've got a job, right? No. You're going up there without a job? Yeah. Well, at least you got a place to live. You've, you've secured an apartment. No, I haven't. Everybody was, there were so many naysayers. And let me tell you, if you've got a dream of some sort that you want to achieve, you're going to have plenty of naysayers in your life. Everybody told me, you're not going to succeed at this. What are you thinking? This is stupid. You, know, you only have $1,500. It's not even enough to get the apartment. Uh, or barely enough. You know, in those days it was enough to get the apartment, but it was barely enough. But I didn't care. I drove up. I remember I arrived one night, and I remember I didn't know where I was. I ended up staying in this hotel on uh, uh, Highway 99, and once I got in there, I realized it was a place of prostitution. There were prostitutes doing their tricks in all the rooms, and I realized this was the hotel I had picked for the night. So I kept my 45 close by and uh, propped a chair under the door and uh, I was excited to see the, the professor the next day and uh, started training. Everything came, came into place. 
I had an apartment in, uh, I think, three days. And then I had a job in five days. And uh, I was kind of disappointed because I wanted a little time off, but uh, I got a good job and uh, with a pretty good company. Uh, and uh, so I started training with him. And this was uh, 1987 when I went up there. <sighs> he did so much for me, that man. One of the things uh, that I was dealing with was severe depression. I was severely depressed and my, my father was very depressed and on medication and had a lot of issues and my father always taught me that it's not your fault, you have a chemical imbalance, There's, you just need the right medications to balance things out, which was a, a, a common approach to that problem. And I remember Brad told me, that's a bunch of nonsense. And I thought to myself, he doesn't know what he's talking about, you know? He doesn't know anything about this. But he told me that it had to do with my belief structure, my philosophy of life. And, and I told him, you know, when I'm depressed, I'm not thinking about anything. It's not anything particular happening. And if you've ever suffered from severe depression, and I mean, I had severe depression, that's how it is. You're just depressed. You don't know why. And he said, you have the beliefs from long ago. They're part of who you are. So you don't have to think anything. They're already a part of you and the way you're interpreting things. And again, I thought it was nonsense, but after a while, he started to make some real headway with me. And I started to make some real changes. He saved my life. He cured me of depression. And I was... Uh, I think 27 at the time, 26 or 27, 61 years old now, and I don't suffer from depression anymore. And whenever I get myself into a place, I can get myself out with the things he taught me. He taught me how um, your beliefs affect your feelings and your feelings affect your behavior. And that's what him and I have done with students over the years in regard to combat. But I have a great debt of gratitude for him for that. Uh, and he used uh, Albert Ellis's RET, Rational Motive Therapy, which is now Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. And I read all of Dr. Ellis's books, and, and uh, it was great. You know, another thing he really helped me with, too, was fear. I grew up with some fearless friends. They seemed fearless anyways, you know. And when fights came on, they were right in the middle of it. And, and every time I got in a fight, I had no problem going off and, and fighting. That wasn't an issue. But I was so scared. There was so much fear in me. And I always thought there was something wrong with me. You know, like, why am I so afraid, you know, when, when I'm about to go into battle? And he just smiled me and he goes, because you're normal. Well, of course you're supposed to feel that way. There's nothing wrong with you. And I told him the degree of it. And he said, wow, what a powerful thing you have there if you can learn to harness it. And I have learned to harness it. Because to this day, if somebody threatens me, the fear doesn't rise as high as it used to, it's control, but it's there. And it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter I'm a ninth degree black belt. Once somebody starts to threaten me, I start to shake, I start to sweat. And I learn that this is normal. I'm amping up, I'm getting ready to go. You know, my hands start to shake and, you know, and, and he taught me what a, a powerful thing that was. <clears throat> He was such a patient man, he always knew what to say. I was married at that time to my second wife, Elizabeth, and uh, Elizabeth had uh, taken up with another man, and that ended that marriage, and it broke my heart. I was really heartbroken over that. And uh, it took me a long time to recover, and he was so patient with me. I remember I would literally call him sometimes five times a day in such distress and he would calm me back down, get my mind rational about things. And Brad could be very angry about things and, like I say, bring out that fury, but he knew not to do that here. He knew where I was and he was very calm about it. He didn't talk in any negative fashion about Elizabeth or anything. But I'd finally get feeling better and I could go on with life. And uh, I was working as a service tech at the time. And, I was working in all these Fortune 500 companies downtown, and I would have my uh, next thing I had to do, I was putting in fax machines and, and doing the, uh, the training of the personnel there. And I would get in such bad shape, I'd call him right back again. And, and you know, I think 
to myself, if somebody had done that with me today, I, I might go, what's the matter with you? We just talked about this 10 minutes ago. How many times are you going to call me today? He never did that. Every time I go, Brad, I'm so sorry. I know we just talked about this two hours ago, but I, I'm just, I, you know, I was just, and he goes, it's Mark, it's okay. We can talk about this as many times as you want. If we got to talk about it a thousand times, we'll talk about it a thousand times. And every time I would call, and he wouldn't pick up the phone, he'd screen his calls, he would call me back within uh, 30 seconds, a minute or something. He'd drop what he was doing. This went on a long time. I mean, six months. I mean, it started to get less where I would maybe call him once a day. And, you know, pretty soon it got down to two or three times a week being in that place. And, and after a while, I, I, I got over it and, and I got past it. But, wow, what he did for me with that. Uh, as I mentioned, Brad was a licensed hypnotherapist. And uh, one of the things he worked with me on was uh, sweating. I had this huge sweating issue. And I was working for this company, the Tell Autograph Company, Omnifax. And fax machines were new at the time. Uh, and all the companies were getting them. And I would go in and install them, and I'd be in my tie and suit and my little briefcase, and um, everybody would come out and they'd crowd around me in the fax, and I would sweat. I mean bullets coming off my face. My shirt would literally be drenched. You'd think I just ran a marathon. And it was just mentally hard. I'm up here sweating, and somebody would come get me a towel, and, and uh, I'd mop my head off, and, and, I, and I told Brad about it. He goes, I can, I can help you with that. He said, let's do some hypnosis sessions over it. And I was like, great. So we went, sat down for our first session, and I remember thinking he was going to solve me the problem of sweating. And he didn't. The first thing he would tell me once he put me into the trance was, when you begin to sweat, you'll know everything is going perfectly. And I was thinking, I thought you were going to make me stop sweating. And I realized over time, he helped me accept the fact that, okay, I'm sweating. I'll get a towel. I'll wipe my head off. But it took quite a few sessions, but he did cure me of that, where... It didn't become totally comfortable to get up and sweat, but I could handle it a lot better. And uh, uh, I could go on about all the things that uh, he did for me in that regard. So in 1990, I was the first man ever to get first degree black belt, to reach black belt in the American combative system, which I'm so proud of. And uh, uh, I'd started in 1979, and it was 11 years. <clears throat> Not all 11 years were with him. That was There was that interim of... Uh, um, well, it was five years or so, but I trained daily when he left. There wasn't a day I didn't train. Well, maybe there was a day, but you, you get the idea. I was training of the things he showed me. I, he taught me how to drill, and I drilled, 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 drilled all the time. I loved it, and I combined it with my weight training, and it took uh, from 1979 to 1990, or maybe it was 91, and I got the first degree black belt. Well, at that time, my sister was running a dog business, a guard dog business, and she made me an offer I couldn't refuse to come back home and, and work with her in the business, and I did. I had gotten the black belt, and, and we, you know, kind of sadly parted ways. And when I got to Phoenix, and Brad had always taught me that uh, when a guy reaches first degree black belt, he's not qualified to teach. You know, people that, and not all black belts are qualified to teach. I mean, you could become a fifth degree black belt. You may not be a very good teacher, but certainly a first degree black belt is not going to be authorized to teach. But he did, he let me teach. I mean, that was quite an honor. I told him I wanted to, to start doing lessons. And I started teaching at the uh, Powerhouse Gym. And uh, I remember I did my first presentation and it, the, the great James Jarrett assisted me on that. And I, I'm, I'm getting straying here uh, on something else. So let, let me get back on track here. So I trained in Phoenix for a while, and Brad and I were in close contact. Back in those days, it was, you know, before the Internet stuff was big, and Brad wrote me, I think, a letter literally four or five a week for a long period of time. I had a stack of letters like this between him and I of such a personal nature. 
um, that are so special to me, and have, I have I've never reread re -read them again, but I think now's the time I'm going to pull them back out. And but he he always encouraged me. He always helped me. I he. he he never, ever let me down, ever, ever. He was always my, my trusted friend, and he always had the great advice, and those letters are, are pure gold to me. Well, I, I, I had a, a violent incident in Phoenix that fortunately, uh, a potentially violent situation, really violent, and it worked out, and I was able to extricate myself from the situation, but I decided I didn't want to be in Phoenix anymore, so, uh, Clint and Nancy Davis were running Champions Gym up in Prescott. You know, the Clint Davis that introduced me to Brad Steiner. Uh, he wasn't married to Nancy at the time, but then he was, and uh, Nancy and I are, are still partners together. Uh, I work as a trainer at her gym, and I ran my dojo for 25 years before COVID came along. And uh, so I started going up there actually once a week, and I had a class, and I'd drive the 90-minute drive and teach the class, and I started to get a pretty good following up there. And then I decided to move up there, and I, I kind of did the same thing I did in Seattle, only it was simpler because it was just 90 minutes from home. But I went up there with very little money and found a place to rent and started the school, and it, everything was a success. And I, I built a good school and, and started uh, training students, and, and uh, him and I just had a, a, a great relationship. You know, Brad was one of my three old men, uh, my, my good friend. Andre Brosser uh, talks about the, his three old men and uh, how two of them have, had died and now Brad the third has passed away. But the old man being that guy of wisdom, you know, that you can go to and help you. And, and now two of mine are gone. And those, those three old men, by the way, are Clint Davis, who passed away in 2007, and Brad Steiner, and, and I, I still have James Jarrett. James Jarrett's one of my old men. So. You know, James I have a tremendous respect for and if I need advice on something I know I can go to him and he'll point me in the right direction and things but Brad was my top old man and, and uh, I'm going to miss him greatly. He was so excited about our project, the video project him and I have been working on and I've, I've already got hundreds of videos that we've done and um, I'm not nearly done with what needs to be said and uh, and Andre understood too, we needed to start to get the professor on video in case we might lose him. We didn't know, I mean this was a year ago, we weren't anticipating, but we realized what's going to happen when he dies? Is all this knowledge going to be lost with him? And, uh, and he has so many writings, I mean, you know, Brad <clears throat> uh, wrote so many different books, uh, you know, some of the accomplishments of, of Brad, uh, uh, you know, he, he pioneered the World War II uh, methods, interest in the World War II methods. Uh, he combined the Asian martial arts with it. He was the guy that led the way on all that stuff. Uh, he, he took boxing, basic boxing from a cousin, I remember he told me, and and then uh, he studied judo at the Judo Incorporate, Incorporated with, uh, I think it was Jerome Mackey was the guy. Uh, Robert Sigward he took courses from, Professor Nakai. Charlie Nelson was his, probably his favorite. And then, of course, Colonel Rex, Rex Applegate. He was 10 years old or something. He got his hands on Kill or Get Kill. He's 10. And he, remembered, he told me that he wasn't allowed to buy it for whatever reason. He had to send his mother in to get the book, and he realized, oh, this is what I want. And, you know, he, he said be, his jujitsu teacher, he's just a boy, you know, would be teaching him something, and there would be a move here, and then he'd say to the teacher, well, when we go here, why don't we just kick him in the knee? The teacher will look at him, you know, it's not how we do it, you know, and, you know, Brad as a kid was realizing what well, sure makes a lot more sense to me, but, you know, he realized, you know, don't get into that. Um, I had the privilege, too, of going to, uh, I think it was Scottsboro, Oregon, where the, the colonel lived, and Brad and I and uh, uh, Brad's wife, uh, Lynn, uh, went up to see the colonel. <clears throat> and what a treat. I got to sit with Brad Steiner and Rex Applegate and me. And of course, I just shut my mouth and listened to these two great men talk. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, the colonel had a great respect for Brad. But I remember Brad had some files for him. And he 
when we got up there, we were in the colonel's office, and Brad handed him the files, and the colonel turned around, and he opened a filing cabinet. He had a few filing cabinets, but he had this one big drawer, and it was full, but it only had five names in it. It had five files, but they were stacked. Well, his was. But that's the point. And he stuck it in the Steiner file. And when we drove away, Brad was, i never seen him like this. He looked at me and he said, did you see the size of my file? And I was like, yeah, I did, Brad, because uh, uh, Fairbairn was in there. You know, there's a file in Fairbairn. You know, uh, Brad Steiner had a file right next to Fairbairn. But I always remember it. He was like, did you see the size of my file? You know, Brad, some of the other things, too, uh, he was a bodyguard and he, certainly trained bodyguards and, like I said, a licensed hypnotherapist, which he applied to the martial arts. That was the thing he really innovated. And there was a, a very well-known martial arts teacher from back east that came out, and he was blown away by what was Brad was doing. And I don't even want to get into that, you know. He, he, he was a scoundrel, and he, he stole a lot of things from Brad, and both of, both of us were disappointed because we really liked the man. And there were so many, uh, <clears throat> there's so many people in the martial arts that are just wannabes and they're nothing, but this man wasn't. This man was a serious martial artist, very, very good. I'll leave him unnamed. Some of you probably know who I'm talking about. There's no doubt of the talent of that man. I remember one day in the dojo, he slammed me to the floor and threw me all around. And, and I, I remember telling this story recently to one of his students or somebody who knew him from back in New Jersey. And he, he said to me, he said, boy, you sure must have fell out of place on the floor. And I told the guy, my background's a wrestler. I've never felt out of place on the floor. You know, I didn't feel out of place on the floor. I was used to dealing with Brad. Brad was gentle. But this teacher taught me a very important lesson indirectly. Because what he did is he said, Mark, grab my, my, my lapel. So I grabbed it, and he made a mess of me. But I learned I'm never doing that again. And over the years of teaching, I've had some of uh, these types come in to my school, and we're talking, and he'll get up and says, guy says, uh, grab my arm, grab me. And I go, hmm, tell me what you're going to do. And there have been a few guys who tried to pull that same stunt, and they didn't get very far with it. So I was thankful for that guy for, for teaching me that valuable lesson there. Um, Brad was the former director of the Society of Law Enforcement Trainers, and I'm not sure this is correct, but I think he was the only non-police officer at the time that was ever uh, given that position. He was the president of the International Stick and Knife Fighting Association in um, Berlin, Germany, and, uh, and he formally created the American Combat Assistant Gendo Dao in 1975. So anybody who doubts who would the originator of all this, these things we see were, you show me where somebody in print was doing the things they were doing prior to 1975. And this man I'm talking about suddenly had techniques out of the American Combato system and his system in the late 80s. He came out to the school in 1988. <clears throat> he stayed with me and my wife. And I must say I was really fond of him. Uh, he was a great martial artist. I can't take that away from him. But that was the only time, too, I ever saw the professor uh, get fooled and really get hurt. It hurt his feelings. It hurt mine, too, that, that this man um, was just such a traitor and, and did the things that he did. You know, and people, with the, the project that we're coming out with, my idea is go ahead and teach the things we're teaching, but for crying out loud, give us credit. Give Mr. Steiner credit, you know, for what he's done. If you want to teach the techniques and ideas and theories that I'm going to lay out and him and I are going to lay out, that's just fine, but it's like in the American Combato system. We use things from all different instructors. For example, uh, part of our stick curriculum is the stick curriculum of, of the great Bob Koga. Well, we give credit to Bob Koga. We let everyone know, this is, these are Bob Koga's techniques that we're teaching you. And any time he taught me something that you know, wasn't his original idea, he'd say, I learned this from Charlie, or this was a technique out of jiu-jitsu I liked, or, uh, this was from, you know, but he gave credit to where it came from and, and, and where he learned it. <clears throat> a great storm is upon us, people. You know what I'm talking about. Here it is, uh, 
December 2020. And I'm going to miss him. And I'm, I'm going to close this out with a, a poem that was written by Andre Brasser. <clears throat> Ode of the Grateful Men. As husband and mentor, the dearest a friend, to many a father whom they knew would defend. A feral world he saw we would face, so he taught us to live and not to disgrace. To train up the spirit, to brighten the soul, the attitude sure to honor the role. To pummel the body, to harden the will, to face gravest danger with the utmost of skill. He taught us of books, of writing and writ, with tongue-in-cheek humor of guffaws and wit. Emerson, Ellis, and philosophers of old, he told us of stories that need to be told. Of tales as a phantom on a nameless frontier, of soldiers and men in cold nights of fear. Death in the cities and life in Seattle, of provisioning men for Earth's endless battle. He taught us of courage in the face of defeat, when it was wisest to fight or to safely retreat. To enter the battle or exit the fray, come back stronger on a better day. Of practical things like using a stick, of guarding our loved ones, that would do the trick. To drive in a backfist or soften with laughter. To end an encounter or avoid a disaster. A father and brother taught us the ideal and with practical skill, this man made it real. Of theology theorems and philosophic thought, he wove these together as his experiences taught. And within his dear men bequeathed each his son, assembled the lessons his forebears begun. And so we were grateful to the man he became, both father and mentor and one and the same. As a father, the seer and sayer too, as the mentor, the realist who brought it all true, our love for this man let us think on today. to live the ideal in our own special way. I'm going to miss you, Brad. Hi, I'm Professor Bradley Steiner, and this is the first in a series of 11 DVD presentations covering the techniques of armed and unarmed close combat and self-defense derived from the American Combato Gento Dao system, which I founded in 1975. Assisting me will be some of my students. You can see them standing behind me. Each one has been in the system for a number of years and is well able to do the techniques and assist me. You lift up your lead foot, drop into the opponent, and the strike lands a fraction of a second before your foot does, lending body weight power to the blow. The chin jab will be effective if you don't use your body correctly. If you just open your hand and just hit somebody in the face, but it will be optimally effective if you do it correctly. So you'll want to do it correctly. From relaxed ready, practice striking directly to the center of the body, center of your body, and practice using the falling step. Letting your lead foot rise and strike just before that foot steps down. In the beginning, you're probably gonna step it and then hit. That's okay. Just keep in mind what your goal is and you'll achieve it in short order.